So if you have a question, please raise your hand uh, and um, come around and get to you. So I have some questions. Um, first for Oscar, um, you talked a lot about building uh, sort of a personal professional profile on LinkedIn. And I think that a lot of us are wondering how we can um, take those techniques or what other techniques you would recommend for um, leveraging the uh, organizational profile. The, how, do you, how do you push library on LinkedIn? Right, so that, that's actually a good question. And as I mentioned earlier, I actually do a full presentation on how to set up your organization's uh, profile, how to use it, and so forth. But first off, LinkedIn, your individual profile is the foundation for all the other things that we do on LinkedIn, which, again, your organization's uh, profile, the uh, San Francisco. So let's just take, for example, San Francisco Public Library. With that uh, page, you have uh, the ability to showcase events that are coming up, talk about what new things the library is focused on doing, share uh, other uh, information. There's actually, in social media, the rule of thirds, which is one third of the things that you share should be about your organization, a, th a third should be about sharing other people's uh, information, and then a third is sharing industry. Don't get into just me, 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 talking about me, because pretty soon people aren't going to be listening to me, 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 <laughs> you know? So, um, but anyways, those are some of the, the things that you, that you can do. Also, it's like Albert was mentioning, uh, the LinkedIn page can also be a, another uh, community where patrons or other people can come and post and share and engage uh, folks. And it's actually a great way to, I think, increase your online footprint too. So if people are Googling your library and they can find that you're in multiple locations, um, that lends both credibility and then also being able to stay top of mind in many different ways. How do you balance that rule of thirds? Uh, I mean, how, how intentional do you have to be in terms of sort of scheduling content, things like that? So on LinkedIn, it's a platform where you tend to want to publish less frequent. Usually, kind of the rule of thumb is posting one or two times a day on LinkedIn, whereas with Facebook, it could be five, six, seven times. Twitter, obviously a lot more. Um, but uh, again, just, you know, if you're posting one or two times a day on your company page, then if you go back again to your, your posts throughout the week, you know, one or twice a week you're sharing stuff based on that rule of third set that I mentioned. Okay. And Albert, you talked in your presentation about um, sort of being present in the online conversation. Mm -hmm. um, that sounds like it takes a lot of time. It does. It's, you know, a lot of conversational leadership and I'm not going to lie, I'm not going to like, you know, mince words that, you know, building a community is something you set and forget. It's something that you have to tend to on a daily basis. Uh, and I think that's, that's where being able to delegate and have multiple people in the process is helpful uh, because it does take a lot of time and yeah, you want to, uh, you have to commit to it. I think you mentioned that you had sort of a team that mm -hmm. is working with you on Albert's List in, in terms of sort of fostering those, those discussions. Mm -hmm. How many people are on your team? Uh, I would say that, I would say three people are working on this with me. Yeah, so they also uh, make job posts, they moderate the community, they answer questions, yeah. Okay, and do you guys kind of schedule things out or is it just whoever's available? Uh, it's kind of uh, just whoever's available. Okay, sort of organic. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, I librarians share... don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> we need a schedule. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I mean, you can use a variety of different uh, different tools to like schedule your content, or even just you know build out a calendar on like Microsoft Word if you wanted to, and then fill in the gaps and fill in the blanks as you see fit. Oscar, I'm sorry, I cut you off. I wanted to address the point about the time and the commitment. So. I'll go back to when I was running the Mountain View Chamber of Commerce, we had Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, 
Yeah, those were the, th the three. And then, of course, the email and the uh, uh, emails and website. Chambers of Commerce are small organizations with small staffs, limited resources. I had four full time, three part time people. And really, it was myself and a couple other folks that moderated and posted some, some things. But you guys, the truth is, and I know this from personal experience, it does not take a lot of time and effort. Obviously, what he's talking about, that's a different uh, community engagement. But I'm talking about just strictly social media, if just focused on LinkedIn. I was able to do that with the limited staff. And, and here's the thing is, is that downloading things on like the app on your phone, using applications like Buffer or Hootsuite, where you can post the same article or same information to multiple, multiple social media platforms. Uh, and then the other thing, it really comes down to managing in your time. If your boss came to you and said, hey, you know what? We need to be focused on social media. You have bulletin boards, I'm sure, out there where people post and you clean them up. Do, do you not? Then why are you not taking, uh, making the time then to, to clean up and focus on the online bulletin boards, i.e. social media? Because what's happening here, I bet you, I guarantee you that there aren't very many people posting, sorry to be so blunt, but crap on the boards here in the offline world as they are on the online world. So the online world is something that you should be paying attention and making time and effort to do it. And plus one to buffer, love it. Yeah, great suggestion. Yeah. You'd be surprised how much crap gets <laughs> posted on our bulletin boards. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot it's San Francisco. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you're probably doing a lot of like live community moderation on that yeah. board out there, right? Every Correct. single day. Yes, it's. So it's, just apply it online and you know be ready for the feedback too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, to that point, I was wondering about sort of lag time and response. You're, you're engaged with your community. Um, you get something thrown up there at 11 o'clock at night. How much time do you allow yourself? What sort of a time lag do you give yourself before you need to respond to something to stay sort of engaged? Hi, Cheryl. Um, I think it's, um, I think people understand that you're not going to be like online all day and all night. Uh, I also think that if you go like say more than 24 hours without removing something, that's also a problem because it's like, okay, uh, are you really committed to this platform and what are you doing here? And so, um, yeah, timeliness is key, but uh, people under also understand that you're human. And Albert, you talked a little bit more generally about um, engaging people sure. uh, in uh, across a variety of platforms. Um, and both of you can probably speak to this. Mm -hmm. um, wh what would you say would be the, the best platform for engaging an online community for, say, a public organization like a library? Um, I think I like Facebook for that because it means you don't have to invest in another platform. Okay. I think LinkedIn, it's very professional. Twitter is kind of the Wild West. Mm -hmm. And... I think, yeah, Facebook is pretty much up there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think too, uh, Facebook is definitely obviously more social, more kind of fun, more mm -hmm. casual, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, we have to remember who our audience is. It's really where we need to start. And again, just going back, just because of the experience that I've had with Cheryl, that Cheryl has a lot of professional, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of tech folks very savvy, very, they want information. And I think you have a responsibility to understand who your customer is and be able to communicate in the platform that best serves the needs of your customer. Yeah, so understanding your buyer persona, mm -hmm. which is pretty much your, uh, uh, your ideal customer or your typical customer who walks in through those doors. That's really important. I see some hands right here. I was um, wanted to follow up on the comment that you made about the 10,000 people, um, 10,000 engaged people, but no, um, here, let me read it to you if I can. If you have 10,000 members and none engaged, that's kind of the worst case scenario. 
Yeah. And I think a lot of library staff can relate to that. Mm. Um, we have so many engaged people in different formats, and I was thinking a lot about what Luis said, too, where we do have a lot of people who may not be connected at the level that our services offer. Mm -hmm. You know, sp high use of ebooks in some areas, and then some people have no access, or, you know, some people are very socially connected and are, you know, we're in Silicon Valley, and we have some people very connected and others not at all. I'd just love to hear more about what your thoughts were about that. Thanks. Yeah, I think the I think the challenge obviously is right that there's a lot of value to be offered, and then there's a lot of different buyer personas that are engaged on a daily basis. Um, just knowing how how much uh, librarians libraries are trying to like serve, and so I think being able to vary up your content and see and post different things on different days while also segmenting your audience. So um, even beyond like building a Facebook community, in my opinion, the most important thing for any organization is to build an email list. And so if you can build separate email lists for all of your uh, variety of different, uh, different uh, programs, that's also a good way to build uh, to build more engagement, and you know, community. The the type of community that I spoke about was, uh, if you were to build a, a Facebook community or a community off another third party platform, but a community, you know, it also extends to what sort of marketing assets you use and how people engage. And so, if your audience doesn't use social and they're only on email. Um, that's 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 a, that's still a community in itself. Even though somebody's people may not necessarily engage with each other, they still engage with you. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Maybe you have thoughts too. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I'm sorry. Just one. Yes, Albert. Uh, Nancy, you were asking the question. One of the things. So I do a lot of work also with nonprofits, and one in particular. Nonprofit is Downtown Streets. Maybe some of you are familiar with Downtown Streets. They uh, recently opened here in San Francisco, but they have uh, locations throughout the peninsula. They work with homeless uh, uh, folks. And one of the challenges with uh, this demographic is the lack of access to online and so forth. But the way they communicate oftentimes with them is through text. Because a lot of them actually have cell phones. There's a I think a government program that I've heard that it provides free cell phone services and cell phone to uh, people's certain economic uh, level. But maybe that's something too for you to think about as a library is investing in some type of a system where you communicate with uh, a certain demographic via text uh, as well. Thanks. My question was actually related, but specifically about market segmentation. Since libraries have such, uh, when we look at our customer, it's incredibly broad. Mm -hmm. And often, and social is a pretty successful way here in San Francisco to reach many of those customers. Um, but our markets are so, even I run youth services, and there are, you know, the book lovers, the currently experiencing homelessness who are using libraries as a home base. There are the folks who just want to be doing homework. Um, often these segments not only aren't aligned very strongly, but sometimes at odds with one another, um, conflicting agendas. And so how do you suggest, th with your library hat on, managing those different conversations on a single platform like Facebook? In my group, uh, we uh, categorize our posts, or we do our best to. Um, one of the things that we've encouraged people to do within our community is to place sort of what their uh, request, what the what kind of post it is in brackets. So, advice, job, success story, things like that. Um, I think in the broader category of all the audiences that you're looking at, that works too. Um, I guess would you would you be expecting that uh, that homeless people, or the people who are using libraries as a home base, or the people who are doing homework in the library to uh, engage in that? I guess in a way where well, that's a question that I'm thinking about is uh, hmm. 
are you intending to like build a build a build a build a build a community aspect that I guess serves them too, right? Absolutely, yes. Right. Um, hmm. I think that uh, for for some audiences, it's both online and offline. Still, like having the right collateral there to guide them to those to those those tools are important, and being able to and. You obviously have me a little bit stumped here because I'm thinking very deeply about how to answer your question. <laughs> I'll give you my email address. You can follow up sure. afterwards. Thanks. <laughs> I've got a long drive back to Southern California on Sunday, so I'll think about it in depth. <laughs> I, but maybe you have an answer. I, uh, <laughs> I think we need to approach communicating and engaging with our audience with high-tech, high-touch. Uh-huh. I tell people, I mean, yes, we live in Silicon Valley and, you know, People are constantly on their phones and they're crossing the street and they're not even paying attention to whether light is green or red or whatever because they're on their phone, right? Um, I mean, I go out to eat with my kids and like literally we're sitting across the table and my kids are on the phone. It's like, hello, <laughs> you know? It's like they're constantly texting. That's like the, the world that we live in. The we lack. do have to balance the two. Yeah. yeah, but here's the thing though, you guys, and we haven't even talked about what about people that do not speak English? How do we communicate with them? Okay, some of them, it's good old traditional way, and that is you translate the, the paper, the form, the, the whatever, send it out or post it. That's how you're gonna communicate with them. And here's the thing too, is, is that, and it reminds me again of going back to the chamber about the way I'd, I looked and ran the chamber because as a chamber organization, you have businesses that have been with you for a long time. They're not going to change. They don't need to change. But it's about honoring the past, disrupting the present, and embracing the future. And if you keep that. those three things in mind, honor the past, disrupt the present, and embrace the future, I think you will come up, and you already have the answers to how to continue to engage with the broad demographics clients that you are serving. Hi. Um, so I was wondering if you have thoughts on like a limit of the number of social media platforms that you should really be engaging in so that it's not overwhelming since there's so many options. So there's Twitter and Tumblr and Facebook and maybe your own blog and there's LinkedIn and um, Instagram. So all of that. So if you have thoughts on making sure that you're not overwhelming people with the number of options or really balancing like how you're posting across all of the different platforms. I think it's good to start and be simple. Um, in my in my thoughts, usually it's Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn are your default, and that if you want to move into an Instagram or a Snapchat or any of these other ones, that it makes sense. Uh, even if you wanted to say like go and use apps like you know Kick that like teenagers use, you could do that too for specific audiences. But you know, as a whole, I think it's uh, I think it's uh, generally uh, what your audience will be using, um, and you go and you find where they are. Uh, in the tech world, for example, you know I have a lot of peers who like to talk about how Snapchat is the biggest, hottest thing right now, and that every tech company should be on Snapchat. And as a marketing manager, product marketing person who interfaces with sales a lot, um, and also knows a lot of people who are very technical, None of them hang out on Snapchat all day to think about purchasing a $200,000 techno technology implementation. Uh, and so when it comes to, I think, libraries, uh, you still do have to keep it simple in, in a lot of ways like that, too. And start out with a couple of platforms, and then as traction grows, expand to your other platforms so you know that there's social proof that there's interest in people following you. Uh, so um, my name is Wen Wen. I'm a digital inclusion fellow at San Francisco Public Library. So as my name or my title tells you, my work is focused on those people, the 20% of Americans who are not online yet. 
Uh, so I have a question. How to engage those people using the online platform to engage people who are not online yet? Some of them don't even have the text message, as you mentioned. Um, so do you suggest like traditional way, set up a table at out outreach events or like lock on the door? And how to reach those people who never came, who never came to the library? Because those people who come to the library, they might be on the Facebook, uh, but for those people who never come to the library, they might need the services we offer here for free. Um, and another question is about like Facebook. As you probably noticed, we have many events posted on San Francisco Library's Facebook and Twitter page. However, there's always, yeah, not many people would click the like or comments on it. So, yeah, any suggestion on that? Um, so, to answer your second question first, uh, with Facebook events these days, um, the thing that I've really begun to hate is that it's also become a, become a pay-to-play um, pay game where you can only invite, I think, up to like 500 people. And then once you've reached that limit, you have to find other ways to promote, whether it's onto your own wall or whether it's to... Um, or whether it's actually running Facebook ads. And so... A word about Facebook ads really quickly is that uh, Facebook ads are actually a great way to get the word out to people in the sense that uh, they, if you target your people, if you target your audience correctly, uh, you're, you can pay very, very low for a cost per click or cost per action. As far as, um, as far as, uh, as getting people on offline, online, uh, obviously, you can't use the internet to reach them because they're not on the internet to be reached. So it's it's imperative, I think, to get out into the community and still leverage your print mail, your print mail, your print collateral, and all those things to get people in, as well as events and uh, get people engaged that way. And you know, there's a lot of different ways that people, I think, engage publicly, right? Whether it's uh, going to fairs, going to the mall, going to the store, um, the election, whether they when they walk into a polling place. Uh, I think that uh, I think those are all great ways to actually reach those people who are offline. So I have two uh, recommendations. Number one, identify some some patrons here at the library, you know, as an example, that are community leaders and ask them to be your ambassadors to help you get the word out to other people in the community that are not online. Number two, identify some local nonprofits that some of these uh, in, uh, residents patronize and also view them as a go-to for information and share information with these nonprofits so that they can spread the word uh, to those uh, individuals that are not online. So um, I have a question for each of you, if that's okay, hopefully. Sure. Um, for Albert, um, I heard you talking earlier about community as a program. Mm -hmm. And what I heard about, you know, what I heard was kind of, you know, maintaining that consistent brand and experience um, between the offline and the online world. But it sounds like you were getting at something more. And so I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, so uh, it's to drive and use your communities as a driver to get people from in front of their computers to into your library. And so a lot of what, uh, what you do online should be focused on that because that's obviously where your product lies in a library. And so Community as a program is the term that I kind of use as that to um, to uh, designate, uh, I guess, what I would describe as uh, taking something from online to offline. And then for Oscar, um, with LinkedIn, beyond, uh, for, for the, from the organizational perspective, for your organizational page, Beyond really trying to promote an image of your organization that makes you desirable to want to work at, what would really be the purpose for an organization to put a lot of effort into a presence in LinkedIn, particularly considering staff time? Stuff like that. Uh, it's about building a community and engaging community and sharing information. I really don't think people are going to go to the San Francisco Public Library to look for a career for the jobs. Because there's a whole different application process for the, for the type of work that you do. It's more. It's really more about again sharing upcoming events, 
engaging the community questions. Maybe someone might ask about a need that they have that could spark you know, a whole different service that you begin to provide, or people begin to provide you with some feedback about things that they want to see improved or different and so forth. So again, it, it really actually, for the, the public library, it's more about building that community and engaging with the community. Hi, I just have a quick question um, for both of you. Do you have any suggestions on emerging social media platforms that we should be paying attention to or using to grow our communities? I, you kind of answered it earlier, but is there anything else out there we should be paying attention to? I, I will tell you what you should be paying attention, and that is activity. The honest truth is there's a lot of different platforms like Albert mentioned, there's so many out there, okay? But start with the, the ones that people are familiar with and that are using. And the thing, it's like working out, you guys. Do we need another gym to prove that, you know, that they work? No, what we need to do is show up to the gym. <laughs> and I think it's also the medium then in that sense because, right, you can show up to the gym, but if you're using the wrong equipment, then you're still mm -hmm. never gonna get fit, so. The other half of it, <laughs> yeah. Any, anyone experienced that before, you know, right? We can, we're all laughing, so I assume that, you know, um, we have. And so I, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's activity, but it's also how you deliver that activity. So it is absolutely, it is correct that, you know, uh, video right now is really hot and um, imagery is also really, really hot. And so, you know, writing 10 paragraph long Facebook status updates might be great for your local politician, but it's not good for your library. And so get on Facebook Live, get, in, get comfortable being in front of a camera. Um, get comfortable being really authentic in front of that camera. If you gotta have your ums and your uhs on Facebook Live, then do it, because it makes you look great. And it's gonna get people to think like, oh yeah, you know, that library down the corner is not just, you know, this authoritative building I walk by every day, but it's a place I can go into and have a conversation with some real cool people. And these people are tech savvy, just like me, you know? And if you're having trouble getting fit, I think Cheryl Lee, <laughs> She's a, you're a personal trainer, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 24 hour. <laughs> Albert, you uh, get, had your second example and you were working at a full-time job in an ecosystem of people that had a full-time job doing the social media. And then in your example, you mentioned it's not a hobby, it's not an additional duty as required or as assigned. You said yeah. it's a full-time job to be effective. So what would the salary range be for a full-time job doing that uh, in reference for a company that has 26 locations, $100 million budget, and 1,000 employees. Are we talking also, like San Francisco salary? Yeah. What would the <laughs> private sector salary be for a social media person, which you said is not a hobby? What would that salary be for a $100 million organization? Also, if you have any insight for a growth marketer, and what would that growth marketer's budget be for advertising for that same organization? So I know how crazy it is to like live in the Bay Area now and how, you know, you can go out to brunch on Sundays here in San Francisco and buy $7 toast. Um, mm. my, my answer to that is probably somewhere between like 70 and 90 K a year. And, and the way you break down the value of that is you measure by how well their social media efforts bring in more people into the library. Um, how the experience of the library changes overall, whether you're getting uh, different programs, the kind of feedback, right, customer satisfaction scores, uh, things like that. Uh, and I guess it's that high because it is San Francisco. So that's, and that's kind of the round number that I've seen for jobs in the Bay Area for a job like that. Uh, mm, growth marketer would probably be similar. Um, budget, budget's a good question. Maybe you can answer that. Uh, yeah, uh, I check out LinkedIn and do a search and uh, reach out to someone because I have no, I don't have the answer for that. <laughs> Network. <laughs> I mean, I guess it depends on what you're promoting, right? Like, I, I realize that you know it's great to like be great at social media, but if you're not promoting that product, then it doesn't work out as well, and so. 
you can get like really low cost per click if you wanted to, if you if you know how to target really well. And if you don't know how to target very well, your cost per click is going to be really expensive. And so uh, you need to really find someone who may not necessarily need a high budget, but knows better who your customer persona is, your customer pain points, and really, really deliver on that. We have time for one more question. Oh, okay. Well, I was I noticed, Albert, that you talked about um, targeted email and how that was sure. a very effective. And I know at my library, we're mostly now using e-newsletters okay. um, instead of email. And I was wondering if either of you could comment on how do you make e-newsletters like Constant Contact or MailChimp more engaging with the community so it becomes more of a conversation rather than just uh, you know, putting out information. So there are key aspects to a newsletter that make it worth reading. Uh, the number one one is the subject line. You want to keep your subject line at a manageable length. Uh, number two is you want to keep what you really want people to see at the top of the at the, above the fold, much like how you build your website for your library too, where all the most important stuff is before you scroll downwards. And then the third part is uh, being able to create that list that is uh, targeted. So MailChimp allows for uh, the creation of several lists actually that you can use, not just one master list. And so if you have uh, various individuals in very, a variety of programs, uh, you can put them on those specific lists and send out maybe a customized e-newsletter to each of those lists that have specific content that you know those people will read. I would also encourage you to get into uh, a schedule that is consistent of when you send out your e-newsletter and try also, like at the chamber, um, we sent it out every Tuesday and every week it was a different uh, theme to the e-newsletter. At the beginning of the month it was an overall inf uh, news about what was happening or had happened at the chamber. Second week we had a young professional group so it was focused on uh, news about young professional group. Third week was focused on specific events that we were highlighting, the Mount Beer Art and Wine Festival or whatnot. And so over time, our audience got used to knowing that, oh, you know what? This week is going to be something different. It's not the same old, same old. And the subject would reflect that. Yes. yes. Great. Thank, thank you, uh, Albert and Oscar, and all of you for a really vibrant uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you.